Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Amen. Good morning, Verse by Verse Church. I pray you are well. If you are new with us, we'd love you to follow along in the Word of God. We have free Bibles at the Welcome Center. Consider that our gift to you. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to the third chapter now uh, of First Peter. We have made our way to the top of chapter 3. Two more chapters to go in this power-packed epistle. First uh, Peter 3 and verse 1. That's where we're going to pick it up this morning. Now... Somewhere down the line, somewhere down the line, we came up with this idea that Christianity is a religion of rules and ceremonies and rituals and regulation, that, that the chief reason we're gathering together is to shore up and bone up on the instruction manual, because after all, God has done so much for you, the least you can do for him is to straighten up and fly right. I mean, is that not what you've been told way too many times to count, right? Look, you, you ought to do this for God because this is what God has done for you. God has done so much for you, the least you can do for him is this. Well, uh, we've all heard that at one time or another, haven't we? And uh, yeah, I see, see some heads nodding there. Some of us have been told that a whole lot, haven't we? Let me tell you something. That is a second-rate, third-string, junior varsity motivation for obedience to the Word of God. I mean, it's better than no obedience at all, but falls far short of the joy-filled, glad-hearted relationship with your Creator that this Word holds out for you. As we continue to look at passages in the New Testament that are bringing forth exhortation and instruction for Christian living, uh, which we happen to be knee deep in right here in the middle of First Peter, right? It is phenomenally important for you and I to step back from time to time and uh, uh, make a proper assessment of how it is that God would have you and I um, to think about obedience. But what we need to keep front and center is this, and, and I need you to hear this carefully and thoughtfully, not the first time you've heard it. God is not after your begrudging submission, all right? God is not after your begrudging submission. Well, I've done all this for you, so you better do this for me. Like, that brings God no glory, right? Parents, I know you understand this. You bring forth an instruction to your kid. Your kid looks at you and goes, ah, and he goes off and he does it, but he does so begrudgingly. Does that in any way say to the other kids or anybody that happens to be seeing that, does that in any way shed glorious light upon the character of you as a parent? Well, no, it does not. On the other hand, now, this rarely happens, but work with me here. On the other hand, if your seven-year-old daughter receives your instruction and says, well, yes, daddy, thank you, and yes, I would love to do that because I know, look, not only is this clearly in my best interest, but even more than that, daddy, who you are has so captured my heart <laughs> that I long to imitate you. I long to be more like you. Thank you, dad, for this instruction. Now, now that doesn't happen. In fact, it's never happened to me. 
Uh, and the reason it doesn't happen and the reason that analogy kind of breaks down is because I, of course, am a father. Uh, I, I am utterly imperfect in my execution. But when we get close to that, sure makes daddy look pretty good in front of the other kids now, doesn't it? The point is this, and, and for our joy, we must keep getting back to this. God is your perfect heavenly father, in whom is no imperfection, in whom there is no shadow of turning, James 1, right? Here's what we've been saying for years now, right? God is most glorified in you when you are a whiny, belligerent little brat face. God is most, well, wait, that's not what we've been saying, is it? What we have been saying is this, God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Now, why does your satisfaction in God, why does your delight in God glorify him? Well, because it makes much of his excellence in character, and therefore it draws others to make much of his excellence in character, that they too might be saved. And that's what we've been talking about here in chapter 2, what we're going to talk about more in chapter 3. But, but I want us to, to linger here for a minute, okay? God is not after your begrudging submission. God is after your joy, and not a second-rate third, second rate third string junior varsity joy either. No, the Bible is clear. Man, God is after the fullness of your joy. God is after you and I absolutely flourishing as human beings. He is after an exceeding abundant spiritual, not, not material, spiritual flourishing of your heart and glad-hearted relationship with him. Now, again, don't believe a word I'm telling you up here unless I can show it to you in the word of God. So let's be good Bereans. We all know this one, don't we? The thief comes only to steal and kill. And boy, we've seen, we've read this so many times, haven't we? The thief has come only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Well, gosh, we've seen that so many times. It must not be true. No, no. Don't be inoculated by fam familiarity, all right? I've put this next one that I'm going to show you before you many times. I know you know this one. Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, hey, man, here's what happens when you abide in me. Like, I am the vine. You are the branches. You stay plugged in. You stay grafted into me. I am going to produce spiritual fruit in your lives. Right after that, he said this. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be made full. Two chapters later, Jesus is praying to the Father. High priestly prayer, John chapter 17. He says this to the Father. But now I come to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world so that they, you and I, may have my joy made full in themselves. The Apostle John echoes his Savior in his first epistle, 1 John. You may remember this. He says, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Are you starting to grab a pattern here? Okay. The Apostle Paul picks up on this all over his epistles. He says this in Romans. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us this concerning church leadership. What is the model? What is the New Testament model for church leadership? Well, it's this. Not that we lord over your faith, and we don't lord it over your faith, but we are workers with what? For, we are workers with you for your joy. Do you understand that we serve a God that is heaven bent upon our joy? Now, here's where we linger for a little bit. Being 
saved Christians now, speaking, of course, to, to those of you that name the name of Christ, being saved Christians now, God is continuing by his great common grace to fill your lungs with air and to give you additional heartbeats uh, to, to uh, protect your life in 10,000 little graces and ways every day that you do not see. Why? Why is he keeping and preserving us? That's Jude 1, 1, by the way, right? So that you might, why? So that you might make Christ known. So that you might make him known. Make no mistake about it. God has put you where he has put you to reach lost souls for the cause of Christ. You are not going to do that if you are not delighting in him. You see how this works? Our chief business, being saved Christians, is to make much of Christ that we would so delight in him that we would desire to make him known. The reason you are still here, the reason you are still breathing, is to make him known. So, God has done so much for you. The least you can do for him is this. No, no. That is shallow, sloppy, Christless, man-exalting, God-diminishing understanding of, of such a great salvation, such a great gospel. God doesn't need you to do anything for him. God is in no iota dependent upon you and me for anything. It is we who need him. So, the, the imperative commands that we find in the New Testament, they are there for you, okay? They are there, God having saved you now, they are there that you might come into and experience the fullness of his bountiful, limitless joy. Now, when others see you doing that, experiencing that bountiful, limitless joy, when others see you doing that, that is when Christianity becomes attractive to those without hope. You become a living magnet for the gospel. God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him. Here's what I want you to see. Because we're in such instructive, intensive material. The New Testament is not a set of rules. The New Testament is not a set of rules for, I, for, for, for you to either get right with God or somehow pay back God for all he has done for you. That's not what it is. It is a new covenant by which God has already made you righteous in Christ. And, and, and having made you righteous now, he is getting after your joy and getting after your delight and getting after your deep satisfaction in him. Now, what happens is, and this is what we said last week, is that when you hover over and linger upon this multifaceted diamond of a gospel, that becomes your agent for joy, all right? When you no longer see the gospel as something to, to move past or, or move away from, when you understand that the entire Bible takes the, the light of the glory of God and just refracts that light in a thousand different directions through this gospel, man, man, man that is when you really begin to get a hold of the glory glory of God and Christ becomes your preeminent treasure in your life. He becomes uppermost in your affections. And I've told you this a number of times too. Whatever you delight in the most, whatever you hold up and, and elevate the most, that's where the rest of your world's going to go. It just is. And when that happens, look, man, when you are delighting in God, when that happens, Evangelism isn't this, this great struggle and this great strain and uh, uh, it's not what we make it out like. How do I carry this? It's not, oh, did I say this right? And oh, man, if I only would have. No, no, no. It just happens very naturally and organically as an outgrowth of your delight in the Lord. Now, because Peter understands the centrality of the gospel to Christian instruction, that was the reason for that beautiful intrusion we had in verse 24 last week. He is here now instructing us in this powerful spiritual principle, 
often misunderstood, but powerful spiritual principle of Christian submission. And then he takes time right in the middle of that discourse to just stop smack dab in the middle of it and just anchor us and ground us in the gospel. Why? Because again, if we move off of or away from the gospel, we, we lose our focal point, man. We, we surrender our foundation and, and then it becomes very easy for us. Listen now, it becomes very easy for us when we are in these instruction intensive passages of scripture, it becomes very easy for us to lose sight of and forget the entire purpose for these instructions. And that is to bring us joy and freedom and hope and rest in Christ. We become living magnets for the kingdom of God. Now, the reason we took some time to center ourselves here is because it's crazy important and fruitful and profitable to have the right understanding of Christian obedience, and particularly here, right? Because the doctrine of Christian submission, well, it doesn't tend to go down very well with many folks, does it? And certainly not within the, the framework of our, our, our culture's narrative, okay? So thus far, here's where we've been. We've talked about submitting to civil authorities. We've talked about submitting in, in the workplace. Right in the middle, Peter anchors us in the gospel. And now we're on to this morning submitting in the home, in the family unit. And then we'll get to the church in the weeks ahead. So we've got wonderful instruction yet again here this morning. Uh, if you will nail it to the... And this is, this is what all of this is predicated upon for your soul and for your understanding. If you will nail it to the ground now that all this instruction is for your joy and for your flourishing and ultimately God's glory. Be good? All right. So we get after it again now here at the top of verse Peter 3. We go to work in verse 1 of First Peter 3. Verse 1, let's go. In the same way... You wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are, this phrase, disobedient to the word, this is the unsaved husband, that they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Well, you see, now I told you, for some of us, this doesn't go down so well, does it? And it is probably here in the home, within the family unit here, that we have the doctrine of submission least understood and least under, uh, undervalued. And because that is the case, we have the breakdown of the family here in our culture today. Okay? Um, so, let's do a little bit of myth busting, if we can, here this morning as we get through this text as well. We're going to discover, and if you've read ahead, you know this, we're going to discover that the ladies get six verses and the dudes just one, verse seven, okay? We'll get to that next week. So let's dial into the context here. Let's understand, or let's understand the culture in which Peter's words were written here, and this text will make a whole lot more sense to you. Here's what we've got. And it's amazing, by the way, some of the things that you see from my vantage point up here. Like, man, I should get one of those GoPro cams and strap it to my head so I could show you one day. But this is one of those passages of Scripture where I am likely to be privy from my particular vantage point to a whole lot of elbows flying in the room, flying around in the room amongst the spouses here this morning. So, so let's get this straight right out of the block. What we're dealing with here is not primarily instruction on Christian marriage, okay? That's not what we've got here. This text is not providing a, a broad-based general instruction instruction for Christian marriage, although it certainly does so indirectly, and, and no doubt will have some ancillary benefit here in, in Christian marriage. But um, in, in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and Ephesians chapter 5 are the primary texts concerning Christian uh, instruction, Christian instruction in marriage. And, and Peter's going to presuppose that, that, that we know this instruction. What he is after in this text is very specific, and it is this. Peter is, now listen up, Peter is instructing a believing spouse how to win an unbelieving spouse to Christ. That's what we've got here, okay? In verses 1 through 6, Peter is giving instructions to the believing wife 
concerning how it is she is to win her unbelieving husband to Christ. And then in verse 7, and far less problematic in Peter's day, um, how the believing husband is to win his unbelieving wife um, to Christ. And that's why we've got uh, the 6 to 1 verse ratio here. Um, in this Greco-Roman culture, a couple of things going on that are relevant to our context. Number one, they were under what is called patria potestas, and that's Latin for power of the father. And this was Roman family law that gave the husband absolute autocratic authority over the household. If he so choose, as hard as this is to believe, the husband could have his wife executed for any reason whatsoever without any legal repercussion. Now, I don't want to see any elbows flying around here. But the Roman family law, it was brutally in favor of the father doing whatever he wanted to uh, with his family. His wife and his children in that day were considered little more than his legal property under patria potestas. And so in this culture, women flat out did not act independently of their husband's preferences. Now, Number two, then, because of this, it was absolutely unheard of in Peter's day for the wife to be of a different religion or hold a different faith system, system than her husband. And so this is why we've got the six to one uh, verse ratio here, because, because here's what began to happen. As Christianity began to spread throughout the Roman Empire, there were an ever-increasing number of women coming to faith who were married to, to these pagan husbands. Well, well, now, what is a sister in Christ to do when she's married to a hard-nosed unbeliever? Because you've got a potentially explosive situation here from both sides of the aisle. From the wife's perspective, she comes to faith, she could begin to, to treat her husband with a bit of disdain or indifference or, or superiority, right? And, and there, that could carry some real consequences that many women were abused and killed. From the pagan husband's perspective, it was a great source of shame to his peer group to have his wife express any kind of independence from him. So you've got a potentially explosive situation here uh, within the social construct of the day. Now, today, we have no doubt a very different social construct, a significantly more favorable social construct, but isn't it interesting when you look at the pew research studies the landscape of american christianity is fairly heavily leaning towards women upon women Here, here's a few statistics to consider the typical u.s congregation draws an adult crowd that's 61 percent female 39 percent male on any given Sunday, there are 13 million more adult women than men in American churches. This Sunday, almost 25% of married church-going women will worship without their husbands. Not much has changed, but for different reasons, right? More than 90% of American men believe in God, and five out of six call themselves Christians, but only one out of six attend church on a given Sunday. Now, what does this all mean? Well, for starters, it means the church needs dudes, all right? I mean, the church needs strong, godly men. L listen to this. This, this, is, this absolutely shocked me this week. In families where the mom goes to church, but the dad doesn't, and this is from the Promise Keepers and the, and the Baptist Press, in families where mom goes to church, but dad doesn't, 2% of those kids will end up in church as adults. That's one in 50 kids. One in 50. When the dad goes to church with regularity, 70% of those kids end up in church as adults. That is a galactic jump there. I mean, do we understand what's at stake here? Here's my point in all of this. Yes, praise God, we have come a long way from the antiquitous, abusive social constructs of the Greco-Roman culture, Christianity of itself, of course, being the great liberty of women throughout history. However, we are still very much in our day experiencing a dramatically underwhelming presence of strong men in the church. And it is having a massive, disastrous impact upon the future of our children and the future of the church corporate. 
And so what Peter, why am I telling you this? What Peter has to say here, there is not one stinking ounce of diminishment in the importance of these kinds of texts in our day, all right? Having a believing wife with an unbelieving husband is very much a part of our landscape today in the church. But I believe this also goes for, listen to this now, those husbands who may be here today physically, all right? They may be here, they're here physically, they're sort of in tow for the ride. I mean, they understand happy wife, happy life, right? But they're not really spiritually present. And if the numbers are legit, I mean, if these studies are representative, which I believe they are, look, the church needs dudes. There's no other way to say it. And so for you brothers that are sort of halfway in the game here, look, I love you. I want more for you. God wants more for you. Allow me to love you well and remind you that all of this is for your joy. All right? And for the delight of you and the joy and the delight of your family as well. You, dear brother, don't forget that you are charged of God to set the spiritual temperature in the home. So, man, I, if you're halfway in the game, I, I, I don't want you getting to heaven one day saying, hey, God, the pastor you gave me, man, he didn't love me well. He didn't tell me what was at stake here because he did. So if I may now broaden the scope of this text, what is the dear Christian sister to do when she has found herself married to either an unbelieving spouse or a spouse that's not really spiritually present in the home? Well, here's what she's supposed to do. Let's get after it again. Verse one, take two. Let's look under the hood of this text together. Verse one, take two. In the same way, underline that, you wives be submissive to your husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word. Underline that word disobedient. You might have not believed in your translation. Very telling word there. Uh, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe. Underline that word observe or see or behold in your translation. That's huge. There's a shift there. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Well, notice he starts here. In the same way, you wives, okay? You might have likewise, you might have in like manner in your translation. Well, well in the same way as what? In like manner of what? Well, what he's doing here, again, is continuing his discourse on Christian submission. He's linking what he's saying here to what he has just said. In other words, in the same way that you are to submit to government, even if they're unjust, in the same way you're to submit to employers, even if they're abusing you. Likewise, he says, in the same way now, wives be submissive to your own husbands. And so just what does in the same way mean exactly? Well, it means this. If you want to have the maximum godly impact upon the society in which you live, well, then you be a model citizen. That was chapter 2, verse 13. If you want to have the maximum godly impact in your workplace, then be a model submissive employee. That was chapter 2, verse 18. We literally spent three weeks on what those principles ought to produce, so we're not going to reiterate that here. And then, of course, again, in, uh, in the same way now, if you want to have a the, the maximum godly impact on your unsaved husband, then be a model submissive wife. Life. And then, of course, again, sandwiched in the middle of all that was Christ offered up as our model of submission and pretty safe to say under less than favorable circumstances, right? All right. Now, before we understand Peter's instruction to the believing wife to submit to the unbelieving husband, we must first by necessity understand what the Bible has to say about authority and headship in the Christian home. If we don't have such an understanding, well, then Peter's instruction concerning the same isn't going to make a whole lot of sense, is it? Now, I understand we're all in very different places here, so let's see what we can do to lay some groundwork. Here's a, here's a, a kind of crash course, if you will. I think where we always need to start is to understand that at the root, 
at the very root of understanding God's order here is that we have to understand that, that God intends the Christian marriage to be a reflection of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. That is the deepest meaning of marriage, all right? Now, man and woman, yes, the two are to become one flesh, Genesis chapter 2. But the deeper meaning is the marriage union is intended by God to teach us of, to point us to, to bring us upwards and into the living drama of how Christ and the church relate to one another. Now, John Piper helps us here. Here's what he says. If you want to understand God's meaning for a marriage, you have to grasp that we are dealing with a copy and an original, a metaphor and a reality, a parable and the truth. And the original, the reality, the truth is God's marriage to his people, Christ's marriage to the church, while the copy, the metaphor, the parable is the husband's marriage to his wife. Now, I I find that immensely helpful. I find that very profound. What, What really resonates with me personally is this idea of a human marriage being a a kind of living parable of the divine union between Christ and his bride, the church. And I, I think when a person understands that reality at the deepest level, love and fidelity and intimacy in a marriage are cast in a new and wonderful light. What we read in Ephesians chapter 5 is that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And then concerning the wives, that they are to be subject to their husbands as they would be to Christ himself. Now, now what this means, brothers, is that we have the tougher jaw here, all right? Because we are to love and serve and lead our wives as Jesus did for his church. What did he do for her? Well, he died for her, didn't he? There's a dying to our desires that needs to take place, that sacrificial agape love. Now, and then ladies, when you are submitting to your husbands, what are you doing? What what are you doing? In that, you are submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now, this, this sort of changes the game, doesn't it? Now, what we need to understand is, well, one of the many things that we need to understand is, These roles, these complementary, complementary, distinct roles within the marriage, they are not arbitrarily assigned and they are not reversible without obscuring God's purpose for marriage. God means to say something about his son in the church in the way that husbands and wives relate to each other. God is saying something about Christ in the church in that. And so a marriage that is submitted to the will of God is a a beautiful kind of parable. It's a a picture of a, a living advertisement before a lost world of what joy and communion and intimacy between the believer and God are supposed to look. And so maybe this helps you to understand, maybe, maybe on a, a new level now, on an elevated level, how divorce and dysfunction in the marriage grieves the heart of God because it obscures the picture of the relationship between his son and the church. When you understand what God intends marriage to be an expression of, a broadcast of, a portrait of, I am telling you, it is a game changer. And so with this context then, let's draw an inference or two into to how biblical headship and submission ought to look. Because I have found that when most dudes desire headship until they, they, they discover what it means in the Bible. When the Bible says a man has headship in the home... This doesn't make, this does not mean that you make all the decisions for the sake of making all the decisions. Okay, that's just not what it means. It does not imply a 
bossy kind of domineering authority. That's not what it is. Biblical headship is this. You as the husband are leading and serving in a way that elevates your wife's needs above your own, in a way that elevates your family's needs above your own. You remember Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, look, let the leader become one who serves. And then remember John 13, that tremendous object lesson where he's serving his disciples. Man, you guys do this. I am the, he who is greatest is your servant. So Jesus says, look, let your leader become the one who serves. Now, biblical headship does not mean you stop leading. It just means you turn your leading into serving. You don't stop leading, you turn your leading into serving. Headship was not given to puff yourself up. Headship was given to build your family up. You are to exercise authority in the home, yes, but that authority is to serve and lead and desire to prefer and elevate your wives and your husband and your your family. Now then, And man, we could make a whole lesson out of that. And if you want to track that down a little bit further, go get our study in Ephesians 5. I think it was 2013 when we did that. But um, because I've got so much more to say about that. Now then, biblical submission for the ladies. It does not mean you are putting your husband in the place of Christ. No, no, no. It means you're submitting out of reverence for Christ. And, and, And by the way, here's what else it does not mean, because this is where I think some of our ladies get hung up. Here's what submission to your husband does not mean. It does not mean you are surrendering thought and insight and input into the affairs of the family. It's just the opposite. God has gifted you and fitted you in unique and beautiful and complementary ways that he has not gifted and fitted your husband for, and he's calling you to to come alongside Genesis 2.20 and be his helper in a way that that honors and, and affirms and lifts up his leadership. You're not checking your brain and will at the altar. That's not what biblical submission means. You are a vibrant, active, utterly necessary, gifted, cherished partner in the affairs of the home. The godly husband recognizes that and values that and longs for that. And I have to tell you this, in all my years of ministry, I have never, not once, never has this happened. I have never come across a mature Christian woman who didn't have a deep desire to see her husband initiate and lead and serve and take up godly leadership in the home. Never seen that. Where a woman did not desire that. Never seen that. Now, What we really have to to recognize here is that sin, right? Sin is crouching at the door, prowling around like a, a roaring lion waiting to what? To devour. Sin wants to come in, right? Sin wants to come in and twist and distort God's good design, right? It wants to take a man's humble headship. Sin wants to come in, take a man's humble headship, and kind of twist it into kind of either a hostile domination in, in some or, or, or a lazy indifference in others. And then sin wants to hijack a woman's godly submission and replace it with a kind of subversive manipulation and and a desire to somehow wrestle control away from her husband. That was Genesis 3.16, man. This happened a long time ago. It was one of the results, uh, direct results of the curse. Genesis 3.16, God said, uh, you are now going to have a desire to wrest control away from your husband, but he will have authority over you. So this goes way back. And so, so sin, look, look, sin has come in and distorted and, and twisted and, and made ugly and destructive what God intended to be beautiful and fruitful and harmonious. A beautiful, fruitful, harmonious expression of the church in Christ has been twisted by the corruption of these beautiful, distinct, complementary roles intended to flourish the family and glorify God. And when we close a little bit later, we're going to be asking God for mercy. 
And we're going to be asking him to redeem whatever headship and submission dysfunctions that have hijacked our marriages and have brought forth all kinds of dysfunction. We're going to ask God to restore us to the fullness of joy that his design intends, his design intends for us to enjoy. Okay? All right. So now then, with that foundation at hand, let us return now to our believing wife here who is being asked to bring forth godly submission in the precarious circumstance where her husband uh, is an unbeliever. Now, how, how in the world, I mean, that's hard enough to submit to a believing husband, isn't it? Uh, how in the world, uh, because I know us, all right, uh, how in the world is she supposed to pull this off? Well, well, let's begin, let, let's begin here. Let's begin with what we know this text tells us about our brother, all right? Now, very interesting Greek word here for disobedient, okay? Uh, you might have do not believe or, or do not obey there in your translation, but this Greek word is apiatheo. It's where we get our word apathy from, and it means to refuse to be persuaded. I mean, it has the idea, this is a connotation, of the idea of a kind of obstinate rejection going on. This literally means in the Greek text to flat out refuse to be persuaded. Now, that tells you and I that our little lady in this example here, well, she has probably more than taken her shot at trying to persuade this man, right? She has more than taken a crack at trying to persuade this dude because notice what he says there. Notice what he says next here. That they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now, please note this. He is not saying they will be saved without the word, the word of God. You remember back chapter 1, verse 23, right? Salvation comes through the word. You, you have been born again through the living and enduring word of God. So that, that's not what this is saying. He's not saying the word. He says a word, meaning her words. Peter's saying... He's not one by a word, her word, but by what? By her behavior, okay? So here's what we've got thus far. Peter is saying to the woman who has taken her shot at trying to persuade her man, he's saying, look, Betty, you need to back off the brother a bit here. Right? Stop preaching at him. Stop beating him over the head with your Bible. This is a brother that's past that. Right? Stop putting Bible verses on the bottom of his beer cans. All right? I mean, you, know, you don't need to put tracks in his toolbox. You don't need to reprogram the radio stations on his truck. Right? I mean, you don't need to leave the Bible open to John 3.16 by his coffee mug. Peter is saying, whatever verbal assaults you have launched against your husband's resistance to Christ, it's not working. What will, however, work is this, okay? Now, notice what he tells her in verse 2. When they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Now, that word for observe, you might have to see there in your translation. Greek word epoptuo, only used once in the Bible, uh, only used in First Peter here, and it means to inspect, all right? It means to watch over a period of time. It has the idea not of hearing, but of seeing and discerning. So, so we've switched now from, from what is heard to what is seen. Massive shift there in verse 2. Peter is saying, look, the way you make an impact upon such a man is not through his ear, but through his eye, all right? And though this man has just dug in his heels and has refused to, to listen to a word of that Bible of yours, right? Every day there is a sermon that is being preached right in front of them through the godly lifestyle that you are living out before them. What is that godly lifestyle? Well, notice. Chaste and respectful behavior. Chaste meaning pure right? You're not messing around with anybody else. You're not flirting with anybody else, right? There is, despite where your husband happens to be, a loyalty there, a, a purity for your love to this man. And then notice there, respectful behavior. That, that Greek word means reverent behavior. And Peter's going to develop this further in a minute in verses five and six. Thus far, Peter is saying this, okay? Look, the lovely 
gracious, gentle submission of a Christian woman to her unsaved husband, the lovely, gracious, gentle submission of a Christian woman to her unsaved husband, that is the strongest evangelistic tool that she will ever have in her toolbox until that man is regenerated, until that man has come to Christ. Now, notice he expands now uh, upon this. He begins in verse 3. Here, here's what else will not regenerate the soul of your man. Your adornment, underline that word adornment, must not be, and then underline these two words, merely external. So your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair, wearing gold jewelry, putting on dresses, but let it be, verse 4, the hidden person of the heart. The, the, this phrase means the inward self. Let it be the in, hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a, notice now, gentle and quiet spirit. Now, that is what's going to win your man. Now, notice who else is impressed, which is precious in the sight of God. See that? Now, we've had some pretty weighty stuff here, so I pray that you will allow me to come up for air and have a little fun, okay? Uh, while saying what needs to be said. Look, you gave me the mic, all right? Now then, at the top of verse 3 here, we have this word adornment, okay? And this is the Greek word cosmos, the opposite of the Greek word chaos. And, and cosmos here, it's where we get our word cosmetics from, and it means to bring order to that which is in disorder. And so here you are, you wake up in the morning, you think your face is somehow out of order, and so you use cosmetics to bring order to an, an otherwise disorderly face. I, I, I don't know. But, but what Peter says here is this, that, that it is not to be cosmetics, it is not to be the cosmos of the outward appearance that is to be the focus. Now, notice he also says here, this is very interesting, uh, um, that it's not to be merely external. He's not excluding this stuff. It's just, just not this alone, like not merely external. Otherwise, he'd have to say, now, now notice the three things with me. Otherwise, he'd have to say, okay, no brushing your hair, no jewelry, no clothes. You got to be naked. I mean, obviously, he's not saying that, right? Merely external. In other words, Peter is saying, Peter is not saying it is sinful to be so adorned just that it should not be the main focus, right? Which is the inner woman in verse 4. So understand, ladies, Peter is not prohibiting a Christian woman from looking attractive here, all right? Now, He's not saying you have to look attractive, but neither is he advocating a spiritual benefit to ugly, all right? And J. Vernon McGee used to say, look, there's nothing wrong with putting a fresh coat of paint on the old barn if that's what you want to do. Peter here is saying, look, it's J. Vernon McGee. Now, look, have some fun. No emails, please. Peter is saying, look, you do what you got to do there, but it should not be the primary focus of the Christian woman because that's not what's going to win your man to Jesus. In other words, I don't care how hot you are. Right? Your hotness is not going to regenerate the man's soul. All right, That's what verse 3 is saying right there. Now, what is going to regenerate the man's soul? Well, notice verse 4. I'm in trouble. <laughs> The hidden person of the heart, or that Greek phrase means your inward self, your inner person. He says there are two qualities to the inner self of a godly woman. What are they? They are a gentle spirit and a quiet spirit. Now, the word gentle, it, it means meek. It means meekness. And, and isn't it interesting? This is the only word that Jesus used to describe, offer a description of himself. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. And what does meekness mean? It means power under restraint. It means power controlled. In other words, though she has plenty of arsenal on you, she is not the kind of woman that's going to bring up past mistakes because she knows that's not going to win you closer to her or Jesus. Oh, there's an elbow or two flying there. So let's leave the past mistakes in the past, all right? 
And then the word quiet there, uh, quiet spirit, um, it, it doesn't mean shut up and get in the kitchen, all right? It means calmness. It means there's a, a tranquility there. What Peter is saying is this, a, a godly Christian woman, th- there is not about her a kind of sky is falling personality. She's under control. She's not flipping out over every little deal. And so that when she does need to express something of import and significance, her husband's going to take it that way. Okay. You're not flipping out over everything. This is a big deal to you. You got me. What what do we got? Because she's not flying off the handle all the time, right? Now, marvelous portrait, understand, of a godly woman that Peter is painting here. Okay, marvelous portrait, and let's get to the root of it. Notice the very root of it all now, verse 5, finally verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women, now, now what is a holy woman? Well, notice now, they are women who hoped in God, all right? In former times, the holy women who hoped in God, for in this way, in former times, the holy women who, by the way, underline hope in God. That's the center of this entire text, okay? It's what allows the woman to, to win her husband with a word. It's what allows the woman to have chaste and respectful behavior. It's what allows her not to focus on the external. It's what allows her to be precious in the heart of God. It's what allows her to, to demonstrate beautiful submission. The hope in God, the trust in God is, is underneath the fruit of all these things Peter's asking us of here. So for in this way, the former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves with what? Well, notice being submissive submissive to their own husbands. Very interesting illustration in verse 6. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, Steve, when you come home from work, don't be expecting Bobby to say, well, welcome home, Lord, and welcome to your kingdom. You know, that, that, that's, we're, we're just talking about authority here. So just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, call, boy, Leonard should have been here for that one, right? Um, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become, notice her spiritual children, her children, if you do what is right without being frightened by fear. Here's what's cool about that. We're called the children of Abraham, the spiritual heirs of Abraham. And so, ladies, you are being called the spiritual daughters of Sarah when you're hoping in God. So, it's very cool. That's for free. All right. So, she is not a fearful woman. Wonderful portrait Peter's painting. She's not looking over her shoulder for the next shoe to drop. What a portrait. She's not fearful. She's not insecure. She's not following the unbelieving husband into sin, but she's not beating him over the head either. Rather, she is simply leading a quiet and peaceable, godly life that is rooted in one thing and that is going to produce the one thing that her husband needs most, that is most likely to win him. And those are the last two things we're going to look at. So number one, what is allowing such a woman, despite her circumstances, to live this rich, free, fearless, peaceable, secure life? Well, it is this. It is her hope in God. It is her trust in God. This is the deepest root of Christian womanhood mentioned in this text. And it is her unswerving hope in God. She does not put hope in her husband. She does not put her hope in her external appearance, but rather she puts all of her hope in the promises of a sovereign, all-powerful God whom she knows is ordering all of the affairs of her universe to her maximum eternal benefit, bringing God the most glory. This is a woman that knows her Bible. She has a very high view of Scripture. She has a robust understanding of the sovereignty of God, and she has put her hope in God. God. Now, the illustration of Sarah is particularly interesting because Abraham was no tower of husbandry. All right? I mean, twice he pawned her off. Picture yourself uh, out to a nice fancy dinner with your husband, ladies. Nice, expensive restaurant. Put a few uh, coats of paint on the barn there. Not that you need to. 
but there are a couple of rough and tumble guys over there in the next booth just staring at you and checking you out. And your husband leans over and says to you, yeah, honey, would you take your ring off? Because I really don't want those guys over there to beat me up. Now, you would look at your husband and you would say, now, look, would you grow some hair and defend me already? Now, Abraham, that's essentially what he did to his wife twice. Genesis 12, Genesis 20. And yet still, she respected the man. And what did God do? Well, God took care of her. And God blessed her. And God prospered her because she respected her husband. Now, notice what Peter says here. Because this is key to, to, to pick this up. Rooted in the hope and trust of God, that, that was her root. What is the fruit? He says that Sarah obeyed Abraham and she called him Lord. Brothers and sisters, that is the language of respect. I want you to notice the very last verse in Paul's instructions on Christian marriage, okay? Here is how Paul concludes his instruction on Christian marriage in Ephesians 5. This is the closer. Here's how he closes. He says this. Nevertheless, each individual among you is also, now he's talking to the husbands here, is to love his own wife, love, that's agape, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. So we got love and we got respect, right? Now notice the two distinct expressions there. The husband is called to love his wife sacrificially. That's agape again. And the wife is called to what? Respect her husband. The Bible calls every Christian man to sacrificially love his wife, meaning he, he, he is to die to his own desires in serving and elevating and leading his wife. And then the Bible calls every Christian woman to respect her husband. Two distinct expressions there. And, and, and here is where we grow now. Are you ready? Now, I don't want to get dogmatic here, but I believe that the commands of God are for those things that do not come naturally to you and I. The commands of God are for those things that do not come naturally to you and I. The Bible doesn't have to command me to think about myself, all right? I, I can do that all on my own, and I'm fairly adept at that without being commanded by the Word of God. Now, it is natural for a woman to have a sacrificial love for her husband and her children. She's mommy. She's nurturing. It is not, however, natural for a woman to respect her husband. Again, Genesis 3.16. And pray tell, how could they after they get to know us? Right, boys? And similarly... It is very, it, it is not natural for a man to sit, now, just as it's not natural for a woman to respect her husband, it's not natural for a man to sacrificially love his wife, right? To die for her needs. That's not natural. Now, it's very natural for us to have an erotic interest in our wives. We can do that. No problem there. All right. That's eros. It is natural for us to have an affectionate relationship with them. That's phileo. But it is not natural for the man to agape love our wives as Christ loved the church. And it's not natural for our wives to respect us. So here is the word of God. And is it not interesting that, listen to me, nowhere in the Bible will you find a command for wives to sacrificially love their husbands. It's not there. You're not going to find it. Isn't that interesting? Now, in Titus chapter 2, Paul instructs the older women to teach the younger women how to love their husbands. But that, that, that's phileo. That's fraternal love. It's not agape. Nowhere in the Bible is the woman commanded to sacrificially love her husband. So here in the word of God are these two distinct and deliberate expressions that are commanded of us. God is doing for you and I what we cannot do for ourselves. Do you understand how beautiful this is? 
It's wonderful. Oh, you should marvel over the excellence of the word. So husbands, sacrificially love your wives. You are commanded to do that because it does not come easy for you. And then wives, respect your husband because your desire is to control him. It doesn't come easy for you, right? And you, you do those things and your marriage is going to flourish. So ladies, look, look let me let you in on a little secret here. Um, and then we'll land the plane. You go into a kid's camp and you see a little boy and a little girl run into the woods. An hour later, that little boy comes back out of those woods with what? A weapon. All right? I mean, he's got a, he doesn't know why he's got one, but he's got one. He's got a spear or a club or a sharp stick there. The little girl comes out of the woods. She doesn't have a weapon. She's got a flower or she's got a leaf or she's got a shiny little rock. She has been designed by God for love and beauty, and men have been designed by God to respect and to lead. You tell a little boy he is nobody, he's never going to be anybody, he will grow into adulthood with a boatload of dysfunction. You tell a little girl she's not loved, nobody's ever going to love her, and she's going to be into some very dark things by the time she's 18. God has put a hunger for love in his daughters, and you got to get this, ladies. God has put a hunger for respect in his sons. Now, we'll get to the guys next week in verse 7, but ladies, here's where I let you in on a little secret, all right? You want to get your husband's attention when he has his face buried in the news or the sports or the television or whatever you bury your face in, Wilkie, I don't know, but, but when you have your husband buried in the sports page or the news or, the te- or he's out in the garage working in his truck or some such thing and, and you walk into that room wherever he's at and you say, I love you, honey. Well, you might get a nod or a grunt. I love you too, in one ear, out the other. But, but here's what I want you to do. You go into that room, you grab that man by the face, you make him look at you, and you say to him, I only got one thing to say to you. I want you to understand, I respect you. All right? I respect the way you get up every day and make an honest living for this family at your underpaid job. I I respect the way you treat our kids. I I respect the way you mow the lawn. Find something that you can use to express respect to your man. Kiss him on the forehead. Walk out of the room. Don't say another word. And I am telling you, you are not going to be able to shake that man from your tail. He is going to hunt you down and follow you around because finally you are speaking a language that that man gets because God has wired him for it. Ladies, you can thank me later. Let's land the plane. (laughs) Again, ladies, we'll get to the men next week. You don't give your husband that, you're going to crush him. You're just going to crush him. If you will put all your hope and trust and satisfaction in God alone and not your man, you're going to be free from the bondage of codependency. Listen to me. The the secret to flourishing in difficult relationships is not to get your strength from those relationships, but to get your strength from God. You look to God, ladies, for your love and security and joy that you long for. He will see to it that he blesses you and honors you and gives you the strength and the kind of testimony that it takes to either win the unbelieving husband or or the one that's kind of halfway in the game. And then for all of us, look, if, you, if you've taken a note on nothing, if you're not a note taker, you write this down for all of us. Be to your spouse a champion of their strengths. All right? You seek out, find, elevate, and focus upon those good things in your spouse. And you champion those things. Do not seek to be an expert in all that is wrong with them or you're going to do nothing more than crush their soul and fan the flames of dysfunction. 
champion the strengths of your spouse. That's number one. Number two, recognize that, that you cannot fix your spouse. You get that, right? You cannot fix them. That is not your job. That is God's job right there. You submit unto, you submit unto God the care for your spouse you pray for your spouse, and, and then you pray to the Lord, like, Lord, show me where you can fix me, all right? And so this week, let us get before God and ask him to redeem his good and beautiful design for us in headship and submission. Let, let us ask that God would restore whatever pathological distortions that might be there so that we might learn of and lean into and begin to experience this beautiful, loving, intimate harmony in our marriages that reflect and point to the loving, intimate harmony between Christ and his church. Oh, the wonder of this mystery that he is making available unto us. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Father, it is our desire as husbands to grow into and experience the joy that Jesus had in serving and leading his church. It is our desire as wives to grow into and experience the joyful, glad-hearted submission the church is to have for Jesus who can care for and provide her and provide for her and protect her like no other. God, we are praying for your mercy this morning. We're praying for restoration for the men among us, for my brothers. I pray you would redeem and myself too, God, I pray for the men in here that you would redeem our fallen headship into modeling Jesus' intention for the church, loving, guiding, taking initiative, leading in a selfless way. And for our wives, I pray that you would redeem our fallen submission to model the church's love and joy in Christ. Lord, would you work in us as we entrust our spouses to you alone? Root our identity in your care for us, in your promises for us, in our love for us. Father, I pray for all the future husbands and future wives in this room. I pray you're sowing strong seed into fertile hearts. And Father, finally, I thank you that we are blood-bought, justified sons and daughters. Nothing's going to change that. This doesn't change that. You're not asking us to do these things to be saved. You're not saying to us, I've done this for you, now you can do this for me. No, no. You have no need of us. You are perfect unto yourself. It is we who need you. And so thank you for your beautiful fatherly heart bent upon our joy. You are commanding these things of us because they do not come natural to us. You are commanding, the, commanding these things of us for our glad-hearted joy in you the flourishing of our marriages. You are commanding and empowering. You never command where you don't empower. You're commanding and empowering to do what we can't do for ourselves. That we might know real joy, that it would be well with our souls. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Let's worship.